Hi, everybody. I am squarely in the geeks camp at the Buddhist Geeks Conference. I'm a technology researcher for a company called Bonnier, and I, I work in their research and development department. And what we do is research emerging technology trends and how they're affecting human behavior. And then from that point of view, we try to develop products that are even better that uh, address human needs that we've uncovered. So one of the topics that uh, we are super interested right now, um, which I think is one of the most important trends in technology, is the issue of digital distraction. How we are dealing with the flood of information we're receiving every day and the devices that we are essentially addicted to. So way back in the 17th century, Blaise Pascal said, distraction is the only thing that consoles us for our miseries, and yet it is itself the greatest of our miseries. And as you can imagine, our distractions have multiplied by orders of magnitude since Mr. Pascal's day. Um, now we have uh, these devices with us at all times, and we have a constant stream of media. Uh, coming at us. So what I want to talk about today is uh, the scope of the problem and how we got there and uh, some of the things that are being done to fix it. And I only have 20 minutes, so we're going to go through a lot of facts. First, um, I want to take a look at the problem. The average American user looks at about 40 websites a day and they switch applications an average of 36 times an hour. Globally, 10.5 billion minutes are spent on Facebook each day. And uh, a new study that came out this week says that the average smartphone user checks Facebook 14 times a day. Uh, each day, uh, the average internet user consumes 37 gigabytes of data. And that's all of the videos, images, stories we're looking at. So, you know, that adds up over the course of a week to 259 gigabytes, which is more than a MacBook Air can hold in its memory. And, um, you know, we've been distracted by the Internet since the 90s, right? But it's been a very radical shift in the past decade um, to a much more serious problem. And this picture, like, guess what these people are doing? <laughs> They're worshipers at the Vatican. And in 2005, they were all just watching the Pope. And uh, in 2013, there's a lot of, I don't know, Instagrams of him or something. <laughs> um, and now everyone is connected, not just spiritually, but literally. All over the world, there's virtually no place where you can go and be disconnected. And there's virtually no human who doesn't have access to the internet. Um, since 2008, an additional billion people from the emerging world have entered into the world of the internet, and they are all using smartphones. These new digital adopters, they don't do the progression that we did. They don't go laptop, or you know, desktop, laptop, smartphone. They go straight to mobile. So just as an example, in Kenya, 99% of the internet traffic is mobile. And uh, in India this year, you know, India has a billion people, and they became the first country in the world where uh, smartphone, inter uh, smartphone internet access surpassed laptop access. They're ahead of us, actually. Now babies are digitally distracted. Um, a study released this week said that 25% of U.S. kids two years and younger have access to a smartphone and use it regularly. And teens are especially vulnerable to digital distraction. The average American teen sends or receives 75 text message, messages each day. Um, that's not counting outliers like one girl in Sacramento last year who managed to send and receive 10,000 text messages a day for a month, running up an astronomical bill for her parents. Now, the effects uh, on the brain, as you may know, of uh, digital distraction are turning out to be not so good. Um, there's been a lot of studies recently about uh, the effects on the brain of this switching between applications. We are hardwiring our brains for distraction by creating new neural pathways that are about quick bursts of information rather than long focused attention. And uh, the jury is out on what that means for our kids who are in this environment, and they are digital natives. They've never known a world without the internet. So how did we get here? Where did all this digital distraction come from? 
Now this is, I am not qualified to tell you the answer, but I have a few hypotheses which I'm going to share for you. And so now I'm about to explain how online advertising works in 30 seconds. <laughs> Um, so the internet basically runs on advertising. Most websites are monetized through advertising. And the way that advertising metrics are mostly calculated is through traffic, which means the number of clicks on a given piece of content. There are also metrics around engagement, which means the amount of time that someone spends looking at a piece of content. But these are valued much less uh, in the media industry than the traffic numbers themselves. Advertisers want to know how many people did they reach? How much clicking around did they do? And that's partially because the internet search engines work by uh, valuing the sites that have more links in coming to them. So since the beginning of the construction of websites, web editors have been incentivized to create content that includes lots and lots of links so that people click around as much as possible. And... Um, they spend a lot of time on the site, hopefully, but they're not incentivized, or they haven't been in the past, to create content that is really engaging, like spending a long time with one story does not earn as much money as clicking all around. Um, Clay Johnson wrote a book uh, last year that stirred up a lot of press called The Information Diet, where he talked about uh, this problem and how you know we've got this media sickness in our industry where sites like gosh, I'm going to go on record on video, so I'm not going to name them. But there are sites who do very <laughs> not great things, like create these uh, link bait headlines, like Kim Kardashian and Kanye West named their baby what? And you click because you want to know. It's North. Her name is Northwest. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, this sort of behavior is not, you know, you're not going to get high quality content. You're not going to read an engaging piece of journalism. You're just going to read some quick thing which further rots your brain. And of course, you know, we are all looking at our Facebook statuses and Twitter statuses and just getting this constant surge of really short bits of content that are not entirely enriching. But there's a counter trend and it's good news and I'll tell you about that next. Well, soon anyway. Um, the second driving force uh, behind digital distraction is the fact that our smartphones have become these multitasking Swiss Army knives. Um, think back to 2004 and think about what you had in your bag. You probably, if you were like me, had a cell phone. Maybe you had a cell phone. You had a Blackberry. You had a camera. Um, you may have had a calendar or a day timer. You may have had a map. You may have had an iPod. And now those are all in one device, which in a way is a lovely simplification of life, but in another way it means you can never put the damn thing down because <laughs> everything that you need is right here. And for some reason, I mean, this somebody create this app if I don't create it first, but there needs to be a smartphone launcher that allows you to block out some of the functionality so that if you're going running and all you want is the GPS and the iPod, then you can shut everything else down. Um, but that's not available yet for some strange reason. So we're at driving force number one again. Driving force number three, um, social media instant gratification. <clears throat> I don't know if you, everybody can read this, but this girl is saying, I need dopamine, like me, make a comment, say lol like you mean it. And she's talking to a random stranger. <clears throat> So <laughs> what happens in social media, like why do you think that people are checking Facebook on their phones 14 times a day? Do you think they want to find out what's happening in their friends' lives? No. They want to see who has liked the stuff that they've commented because every time you get a positive reaction, like somebody favorites your tweet or somebody likes your Facebook photo or you get a nice comment, you get this rush of dopamine and it's sort of akin to what you would feel from sex or from a drug and it feels great, but it's not that good for you to be seeking that all the time. It's sort of like addiction. So, <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, there are a lot of people thinking about this right now. There's a lot of scientific research being done. There's a lot of technology design research being done. And finally, there's a lot of people just trying to figure out for themselves how to manage their own media consumption. So let's take a look at some of those efforts. First of all, the good news, the counterpoint to the... Uh, Twitter culture and the Facebook status culture is that 
it does seem that uh, long-form media is coming back. In the past year, some of the biggest startup leaders, like Evan Williams, who is the founder of Twitter, he launched this new site called Medium, which is uh, a site for high-quality, long reads. And when he spoke at the GigaOM, uh, I think it was the Roadmap Conference last year, he uh, made a comment about how we need to eat more information vegetables. We need to... <laughs> so that's the media trend, information vegetables. And um, other sites are following suit. There's a really cool new uh, magazine journalism site called Epic that has these beautiful interactive uh, magazine stories. And so... It, I think part of it is driven by more and more people having iPads and more and more people having, you know, nooks and Kindles and things that kind of facilitate like a lean back experience on the couch where you want to get in and read and you don't, you're not just like standing there in line with your phone um, just reading something really quickly. The context in which we consume media determines what device we use and it determines what kind of media we consume. And more and more people seem to be coming back to long form media, which is great news. And it actually sort of means that we are shifting slowly toward an engagement-based uh, advertising structure. Um, and the reason that hasn't come faster, actually, is because it actually takes quite a bit of technology to target the right users. I mean, it only works, like, if you're going to spray your message across the, lar you know, the largest swath of population, you're going to get some percentage of the people who will buy your product, right? But if you're only going to have like a much smaller segment of the people checking out the content, you want them to be the right people. And now uh, there's much more, much better technology that helps uh, content creators create the content that the that people want according to their interests. And um, advertisers are getting better and better at targeting you, so that you will see advertisements that for products you like, and then the advertising is also not as annoying. So. Um, media, well, websites are, are changing. The way that they're designed is changing. This is the New York Times. Um, actually, I'm not quite sure. I don't know if they've launched this yet, but in the past couple of weeks, they've started talking about this redesign that they're going to do. It is radically simplifying the website. As you can see, like, you know, New York Times, best uh, newspaper in America, still a link bait disaster. Like, there are eye tracking studies. I don't know if you know about that, but um, you can, you know, measure a person's brain waves and, and see, like, where their eyes are zipping around on the screen. And the average person's eyes just zigzag all over a screen when they look at a site. Um, the new paradigm in web design is to build cascading pages where the content, you know, continues in one flow. And um, this focuses our attention and gives us the thing that we're trying to read, and we read it, and we don't have to, like, decide, you know, which thing do I read next? Oh, my God. Um, so that's good. And um, software uh, interfaces are also being redesigned. This is the much maligned Windows 8. Um, but I think it's a really good example, actually, because, um, you know, you can see in Windows 7, I guess that is, like, there's just all kinds of shit going on. And <laughs> in Windows 8, this is called Live Tiles. And um, the idea is that you, it, it's this new trend, well, sort of new, called glanceability. Like, you want to be able to see the information that you need at a glance and know whether it's important. And then when you choose the thing that you want to engage with, that opens up for you and just that, and that's what you engage with. And um, this, is, this is something that is sort of trickling through the tech industry right now. There are also um, tools that have been developed to help users limit their own internet time or their, you know, help them with their focus. One is called Freedom, and um, this is really popular with writers, actually, because there are a lot of people who have to sit in front of a computer to get their job done, and the internet is just such a temptation. Like, I don't know, that blank page is in front of me, I don't know what I'm going to put on it. Uh, let me just find out what's going on with Northwest and Kim Kardashian. Um, <laughs> But this actually allows you to set a time limit for yourself. Like, okay, I will give myself 10 minutes of internet time. And then the internet is off limits to me. The, the bottom one is called isolator. It's actually just more of like a visual trick to like fool your mind into being more focused. But it brings whatever window you're working on into the foreground and sort of shades out everything else. So you can access that stuff if you want. But it's, it's a good sort of way to focus your attention. So, um, interestingly, even among the most connected people, I don't know if I said this already, but I live in San Francisco. I am entrenched in the most 
digitally distracted people in the universe um, and their world. And um, the trendiest thing that you can do probably in San Francisco right now is um, go to a pop-up magazine event. This is uh, an event series that features live magazines being presented on stage, um, and they are ephemeral. The, the work that's presented on stage has never been presented before. It'll never be presented again, and there are no cell phones available. Um, and so you have writers, uh, photographers, videographers, musicians who come up and perform this live thing, and then it's gone. And people love it. Every time the tickets go on sale, they sell out in like 30 minutes or less. And um, yeah, there's, there seems to be a trend toward really, you know, the more, we, the more time we spend online and the more time we spend virtually engaging with one another, the more we crave real life, real engaging experiences which also sort of gives rise to, I think this is sort of ridiculous, because, like, just go camping, right? But <laughs> um, these digital detox events, like, no offense to Shambhala Ranch, lovely, but um, they're, like, high-end resorts. They're pretty expensive experiences, and you have to check your phone at the door. Um, but it's, you know, it's a... a <laughs> there was a New York Times article recently called The Joy of Quiet, and the author said that um, he feels that the future of travel is uh, what he called black hole resorts, places that you can go to and escape technology, because, you know, if you're like me, I mean, I work for an international company, I have an always-on international cell phone, pro, uh, whatever it's called, system thing, and... <laughs> <laughs> Service plan. Um, and so it doesn't matter if I'm in Stockholm or like where I am. I mean, like I'm, I'm on the internet, you know. I, so these sorts of things are really valuable. And it's, it's becoming more and more precious to us as humans to get offline, get into nature, find spaces for ourselves. And one way that you can do that in an easy way, like without, you know, disappearing to the far reaches of the wilderness, is um, what's called a digital Sabbath. And I think this is a very beautiful concept, actually. Um, this uh, Sabbath manifesto uh, is a promise that you make to yourself and your family that um, you are going to take time out from the Internet from, you know, you can set your own rules, but from Friday at sundown through Sunday or all the way through the weekend, if you like. And um, it's really mimicking the original idea of the Sabbath because um, the, the original intention there was for families to have time together and to have time away from distractions and to have meaningful interactions and to reflect on you know, their connection to one another, their connection to God. And um, this is really cool. I, I came across this book by... Um, Abraham Herschel. It was written in 1951, and it was called The Sabbath. And he called The Sabbath... Oh, shit. It was such a good term. A palace, a palace in time. Thank you! A palace in time. Isn't that beautiful? So um, you can create a palace in time with your own family in your own home um, to, you know, take the time that you need to really focus on each other and not be digitally distracted. Um, also, <laughs> mindfulness itself is making its way into every company, like technology companies in particular, as you just heard from Jerry. Um, and this is Chade Meng Tan, who is uh, the head of Search Inside Yourself, which is um, a program at Google for mindfulness. And it began with just you know, an opportunity for Google employees to uh, get away from their work and make time in the middle of their workday for mindfulness. But it's actually become this amazing leadership program that incorporates mindfulness and emotional intelligence into the leadership process. And um, there's also uh, a whole bunch of technologies um, that, are, that are coming soon that will kind of take some of the burden off of us in controlling our own uh, digital distraction and probably help us out. Like, <laughs> this looks like crazy, you know, science fiction stuff, but these are two devices that are already available. You're probably familiar with Google Glass. It's got a ton of attention. And, you know, what Google Glass is doing is using um, the semantic web to surface the information that you need when you need it, based on your location, based on what's happening, you know, with you and your friends, etc. cetera. And um, the device on this side is called the Emotive, 
and it actually measures your alpha brain waves, and uh, you can control a video game with it. And that's already available. Um, and that's only just, you know, measuring just one area of brain activity. And I don't know, you probably know that alpha brain waves are the same that uh, we generate when we're meditating. That's like the concentration and focus uh, energy. So um, just recently, scientists were able to use brain waves to control prosthetic devices. And um, we're getting really close to an era when uh, we can combine really intuitive knowledge that uh, comes to us, like the things that we need to know right now. And uh, we're not going to have these interfaces that are so distracting. We're not going to be carrying around these Swiss Army knife phones because our gadgets are totally going to change. So people are saying, like, oh, my God, are our kids going to become zombies? And no, I, I actually don't think they are. I think there's actually a really positive uh, potential for a future in which not only are we much more mindful of our media use, like I think our kids and their kids are going to think about cell phone use the way we think about smoking. Like, I can't believe you thought that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>